Well, I'm really excited to have this conversation today. In Philippians 4, 7, Paul prayed that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And our guest came to know the peace of God through the process of humility, which he discusses in the book, The Hidden Peace. Please welcome the Director of Theology and Research at Proverbs 31 Ministries, Dr. Joel Mudamali. Come on in, Joel. Hi. <laughs> So do we get the name right, Mudamali? You guys nailed it. Okay, yeah. all right. That's all awesome. Nail perfect. Nail it once. That's it. That's it. <laughs> now it's just Joel from now. Now it's Joel, right? Yes, sir. I saw you, uh, uh, the, I guess, for the first time on a podcast with our our dear friend, Lisa Turker. Yeah. And, of course, she's been here to Daystar and... Um, well, I was really impressed with um, just your knowledge and understanding of the word. So uh, where did that come from? Uh, you, you would be considered a Bible scholar. Tell yeah. us a little bit about your background. Yeah, I mean, uh, Joni and Dr. Doug, my earliest memories are of being in the presence of God's word. My grandparents are missionaries in India. They've oh, wow. been in ministry for over 62 years. Are they still uh, alive? They're still alive. I show their picture. I think yeah. we have a picture of them. They're yep. just adorable. Um, I see that they're on, it looks like they're on a beach in this picture. Yes, there, there, they, they, are. Are. there they are. Look at them. So uh -huh. my grandfather, so in Telugu, which is a language we speak, it's Tathya. So my Tatha, he's 87 years old. And wow. my grandmother, Amama, is 80 years old. Uh, and y'all, they're just having fun on the beach. This is actually in Destin, Florida. They came for a visit. Um, and so from the earliest memories, That's my- such a beautiful beach, Yeah, right? this is a fun one right oh, there. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yep. And let's show your family. You have a beautiful family, four children. That's right. Three boys. And your beautiful wife. And my three wife, boys Brit. and a girl. And we, yeah, our fourth is a little baby girl. Her name is Amelia Jane. You finally had the girl. We had the your girl. Your wife was going to keep on until she got the girl. Right. That's right. That's right. That's right. And we and we got her, and she is just an absolute princess uh, uh -huh. in our family. I know she I've is. nicknamed her MJ after the greatest basketball player of all time. So if you if you know, you know. There you go. Mm -hmm. I there love go. that. I love that. So uh, continue on a little bit about your background and kind of how you got involved in. Uh, really understanding the Word of God. Started yeah. with your grandparents? Started with my grandparents. I actually lived in India for two and a half years. I was born in Chicago, but I lived in India for two and a half years when my mom finished uh, medical school. And so my earliest memories are of actually going with my grandfather to these rural villages as he kind of shared the gospel mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. people. It's a, a, cla a caste system called the Untouchables. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was always fascinated with the way my grandfather, he unpacked God's Word, the story of Jesus, um, oh, who wow. was God and became man in order to reunite his family back mm -hmm. together. And like most kids and most children, I went through a season of rebellion, of trying to run away from God's call on my life. Uh, and I just had some incredible pastors and youth pastors and ministry leaders that just kept calling me back mm -hmm. to, uh, to God and to his word. Mm -hmm. And I sat one day with the scriptures and I was reading through the Bible. I'd gone through a really difficult season in my life. Uh, and I'm just, I kind of had that, that tension point of this is actually true or it's not. Mm -hmm. And if it's true, I'm going to give my whole life Amen. to this. Uh, and honestly, what it came down to was Jesus. C.S. Lewis famously talks about how either Jesus was actually the son of God or he was a liar and a lunatic. Mm -hmm. Like you kind of mm -hmm. can't have both things here. And I just came to the conclusion, Jesus actually is who he said he was. Amen. How old were you when you kind of had that epiphany, if you will? Yeah, I was probably about 17 years old. Okay. Yep, 17, 18. And from there, it was... So your was, wild years were kind of short. Yeah, yeah. Like mine, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. I radically saved at 19. Exactly. So my, my radical years were short. Yeah. God, yes. And then, um, and then just some interesting things. Like you're looking at the Bible and you go, oh, the Bible wasn't actually written in English. Like... It was originally the Old Testament, Hebrew, some Aramaic, and the New mm. Testament, Koine Greek. And, and then you're like, well, I kind of want to know what the Bible meant in its original. Mm. And that was really my journey into it. And then the culture and the context of the ancient world and how these first readers and hearers of the Bible, how they understood scripture. Mm. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was this eye-opening experience where I felt like I was able to walk with, G I think of Luke 24, Jesus on the road to Emmaus, like, what would it have been like mm -hmm. to be with Jesus as he unpacked the entire Hebrew mm -hmm. Bible? And that's been kind of my journey ever since. That's awesome. Well, that's awesome. Well, tell us about this journey, this particular journey that you do in the hidden piece about humility. Because humility, I don't remember 
a sermon on it much. I mean, I remember, you know, that God told, said that Moses was like the, you know, the most meek the man, mo- yeah. right, in the world at that time, and how God trusted him with his revelation, his word, his people, you know, because when God trusts you, that's a big deal. But how did you come to this place of like the Lord saying, and this is where you need to kind of focus? Yeah, uh, for me. And was that an issue, like you not having humility as the road oh, to yeah. humility? Oh, Just yeah. Talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. It's like the road to patience. <laughs> yeah, <right>? exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's through yeah, testing, is, right? Yeah, he's I'm understands traveling. about I'm the, the, the road I'm to patience. I'm traveling the road of patience. I get opportunities <laughs> daily. It's yeah, amazing. It's absolutely. God is so good. Yeah, it, yeah. It's, it presents itself right in front of us consistently. Yeah. Uh, for me, it was interesting because humility wasn't the message I wanted to write on. Um, and yet it was the very thing that God wouldn't leave me off the hook with. Mm -hmm. It just kept, and I kept going back to like, why is it? And, and to your point, Dr. Doug, nobody, I've not seen anybody yet run around waving the flag of humility. Like this is the thing that I'm going to, you know, or long suffering or long suffering. endurance. These virtues are kind of in the background. Exactly. (laughs) And the question is why? And then look at the tension, like what is the pain point that people are feeling today? Mm -hmm. And even just like you can turn on the news channels or your social media channels. And it's like, there's more fear than Mm. ever before. There is more anxiety and angst than ever before. There's more a feeling of uncertainty and a lack Mm. of control than ever before. And the culture has taught us and trained us. Well, the way that we deal with this is we rely on more human power, Mm. human strength, human control. And yet the outcome of this is deeper levels of pain, deeper levels of Mm -hmm. exhaustion, unrest. And it's like we're in a spiral Mm -hmm. that is just Mm -hmm. taking us out of control. And yet what's hidden in plain sight throughout the scriptures is the ancient virtue of humility. Mm -hmm. It's, it's this idea, and it's like, well, what is humility? And uh, it's famous, C.S. Lewis is uh, anciently kind of attributed to the statement, humility isn't thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less often. By the way, very mm. dangerous to disagree with C.S. Lewis, mm. so I'm not going <laughs> to do that. Right, right, right. I'm not going to do that. But I will suggest humility, biblical humility, mm. actually doesn't start first with the self. Mm-mm. It starts first with an awareness of God. Amen. If I can know who God is... Mm-hmm. Wow, then I can, the second movement, I can know myself, made in the likeness and Mm -hmm, image of God. mm -hmm. And if I know who God is and I know who I am, then now I know how to rightly relate to other people. Mm -hmm. And see, the order matters. We start first with God, then we know ourselves, and then we can know others. So then I actually have the gift of peace with God that can never be taken away from me. I have an internal peace that God has given me, mm-hmm. and I'm equipped with the power and the opportunity to create environments of peace mm-hmm. with those that I'm in relationship with, those that mm-hmm. I'm in community with. And, and I'm just really, fascinated by that concept throughout the scriptures. It's really powerful because in, in scripture there are several places, but humility is one of those places where you just agree with God. Mm. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? When, yeah. when God created Adam, the first thing is don't eat the apple. Yeah. That wasn't about the apple. Yeah. It was about I'm king and you're not. That's right. Let's just get this pecking order in place. Right. And when we agree with God that we're not God, that there's billions of us, right? Okay. And then we're in agreement. Or and that I think things in our life are God's. Well, you don't, yeah. I mean, so many people have them because some carry them in their phone and they carry them, <laughs> you know, right? So, but just to say that when you agree with God, that peace comes when you agree. Yeah. You know, sometimes that's repentance. Sometimes that's just, uh, you know, God just sharing his heart with you. But you you get an agreement. And from that place, you can be humble because you don't have to carry the weight of the world. That's right. You don't have to supply your needs. Or you don't right. have to attain some status or like you said, a bunch of letters behind your name trying yeah. to prove something Yeah. because you're not going to find the peace in all of that, even though that's great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the motive behind that and what was driving you was part of your problem, wasn't it? Absolutely. I mean, I had gone through so much schooling, you know, Uh, And I had this uh, early story in my life where I write about it in the book where I had just come back to the States. Um, I had learned Telugu. That was my primary language that I knew. And I could understand English pretty well, uh, but couldn't speak it, just knew a few words. And so I walk into uh, this this classroom and I won't ever forget it. Like it's almost that that marked moment of your life where Mm -hmm. you walk in and here are all these kids. And I had come from a context where like I was known. I was the grandson Mm -hmm. of Dr. K.M. John and he was in school systems Mm -hmm. and settings like anywhere he was, I, like I knew my place. It was great. Mm. And I'm, I'm thinking, y'all, if there's one place for me to be successful, it's going to be in a classroom setting. Yeah. So I'm walking <laughs> in thinking like, I'm going to crush it. I'm going to crush this. <laughs> and I walk in 
and I quickly realize um, that something is off. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I walk in and I get in there and all these kids are around uh, and the teacher starts to ask questions. And my thought is like, I need to be the first to answer the question to really establish like I belong. This was your, this is your replace of dominance. This is my, yeah. <laughs> and the teacher asks, my strong suit. yes. And the <laughs> teacher asks, um, uh, does anybody have any pets? Remember my receptive English is high. I'm like, raise my hand quick. I go, Joel. Yeah. What pet did you have? And I said, dog. She goes, great. And then she asked a follow-up question. By the way, I just don't like follow-up questions ever since this moment, you know? <laughs> and she asked us, so what's your dog's name? And then I had panic. Because I knew what she was asking me, but I didn't have the words mm. to be able to communicate it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I just responded, dog. <laughs> and, and at this point, this is exactly, the kids, they start to laugh. And then, and then the teacher goes, oh, sweetheart, sweetheart, no, no, no. What? And she ta oh, started talking no. slower, as if the slower talking was going to help me understand, right? So she goes, um, no, 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 what is the uh, name of your dog? Right. And so I just responded, dog. And the teacher oh, laughs, yeah. the kids, there was this little white rabbit that was in the corner. I'm, I swear the rabbit was laughing yeah, at me, you sure, know? Sure, sure, sure. Um, and, and Joni and Dr. Doug, this was the first moment that I realized that the world wasn't safe. Mm. That, that the control that I thought I had was actually a false illusion. Like mm. I actually don't have control over really anything. Right. And I made a vow to myself in that moment. Mm. I will never walk into a room mm. where I'm not Top at least up. one of the smartest. Like, mm. I'm never going to be caught off guard. I'm never going to be blindsided. Like, I'm, And that sent me on a journey, a pursuit of mm. an undergraduate deg degree in biblical studies. I got a master's degree in mm. organizational psychology, uh, an MDiv, a THM, and then a PhD in mm. biblical theology. And you know what I found at the very end of the entire journey? I was more aware of what I didn't know. Right, exactly. The more educated <laughs> you are, the more you realize you don't. The more you realize. Absolutely. And it was in that moment where I go, huh. The very place where my limits are, where my weakness is, where what I know ends is actually the perfect place mm -hmm. where the infinite ability of God begins. Amen. Wow. And so that is the place of humility. Yeah. You know, you, in your book, you talk about three distinct benefits of understanding humility and its place in our lives. And one mm -hmm. is protect, protection, one is prevention. One is preservation. Yeah. Maybe talk about those three. Yeah, you know, humility for a long time. Some some people are listening right now, and and there's a resistance. You have a resistance. You're like you're like um, Joel. Humility is not the thing that I want. It, it's the very thing that it's is not my t-shirt, man. It's not my <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's an invitation for weakness. It's an invitation for people to walk all over me and step. And I just wanna I wanna encourage you with what is biblical humility. Not the type of humility that the world and the culture is trying to wield in the hands of the powerless that makes the weak hurt. No, 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 I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the virtue of Christ, the humility of Christ. This is what it is. It is a protection, a prevention, and a preservation. Humility protects you. It protects you from thinking too low of yourself. You are not too low. You don't deserve to be stepped on and walked all over because you daughter, son of God, are made in the likeness and image of God. But humility is also a, pro, a, a pro prevention. It will prevent you from thinking too high of yourself. Because if you think too high of yourself, inevitably you will be the one who walks over other people. And humility is a preservation. It preserves you in the life of Christ. It reminds you of what it means to be rooted in the strength and the power and the control of Jesus himself. And this, I think, is the power of humility that we ought to strive towards. Amen. You know, going back to your story, for you, because you're this little pure-hearted young man, yeah, going into a place where you thought you were going to be strong and you were hit, that was trauma for you. Yes. That was trauma because you were, you were humiliated. Humiliation yeah. is different. Yes. Then humility. Yes. And yeah. now some of us, that's our path. Mm -hmm. You know, I would tell people, um, there's two paths to humility. You can humble yourself before God. Yeah. Or you can be humiliated. He doesn't care about method more as much as he does about outcome. Yeah. Right. And mm -hmm. so, but that, that kind of, that was trauma for you. Yeah. And then you overcompensated and all that kind of stuff. Like, you know, people do when they get traumatized. So, you know, the, there's lots of people who've experienced all different kinds of trauma and they protect themselves. Yeah. You know? and, and so I think people are probably like, yeah, I've experienced humiliation. 
you know? So and this is fascinating for me. Um, and I think about your book, Joni, through, mm -hmm. you know, through the storm. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, one of the things that I've come to the conclusion is that in the Bible, the most important preposition is the preposition through. Mm -hmm. Most important preposition. It was necessary for the Israelites to get through the Red Sea. Why? So they could experience the protection of God. Mm -hmm. To get through the wilderness. Why? So they could experience the mm -hmm. provision of God. Mm -hmm. It was necessary for Jesus to go through Samaria. Why? So he can meet a Samaritan woman, half Jew, half Gentile, who becomes the first female evangelist. Mm -hmm. It was necessary for Jesus to go through the cross. Why? So that we can experience the power, the protection, mm -hmm. and the presence of Jesus himself. And so for the person who has experienced humiliation, Humility is actually a gift for you because it will help you go through that experience mm. so that the humiliation won't break you as a person. Mm -hmm. But as you get through it, you will learn like who you are in Christ. Yes, that's important. And sometimes we can't control the humiliation. Sometimes it's brought on us. <laughs> and so we need a gift, right? We need a right. guide. We need some help. And, mm. and the most yeah. unexpected thing is actually humility. You know, one of the things you said that I loved is that um, humility looks at the success of our brothers and sisters mm. and encourages us mm. to celebrate them Amen. and not be threatened by them or competitive with them. Yeah. You see that so much in the body of Christ. Yeah. Instead of loving one another and celebrating, yeah. you know, there's that, that competition thing going on. Was that something you had to struggle with early on? And, and, and people watching, they're, they're like, well, how do I attain humility? Like, yeah. what do I do? Can you kind of talk about that? Yeah, as well? Well, let me do that one first. Um, humility, I think at times can feel like it's a checkbox that we move on from. And y'all, humility is not a checkbox that we move on from. It's actually the soil of the Christian life that we mm. live from. Mm -hmm. In Galatians 5, Paul has this agricultural imagery of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kind of all of this stuff, mm -hmm. right? It's beautiful. And, and we're left questioning, well, what's the soil? That this, that this, the fruit is planted in, mm -hmm. and to the church in Corinth, to the church in Ephesus, to the church in Galatia, Paul is saying some pretty um, aggressive statements. He's saying, "Put on the humility of Christ." He's saying, be associated with the humble. The Greek word for humility is tapianos. And, and in the Greco-Roman world, it was almost exclusively negative. So if you're in the church and Paul's like, hey, by the way, Joni, uh, Pastor Doug, uh, Dr. Doug, like you guys should take on humility. You'd be like, excuse me, wait a minute, <laughs> hold up. Like, that's not for me. That's for them that are on the yeah. outside. And, and yet it's like, no, this is what Jesus invites us to. And, and so um, it's so powerful because when humility is the soil of the Christian life, it actually helps us to live the Christian life, the mm -hmm. fruit of the spirit in a powerful way. So that's the first thing that, that it's not something we move on from. It's actually the soil that we live from. Um, and then the second thing about uh, the success. So you see what you're describing there, Joni, is actually insecurity. There's an insecurity inside of us. Yeah. And I just want to say this, if you're feeling like uh, you are insecure in this moment and you're struggling with that, I want you to know that the insecurity that you're feeling is a feeling, and yet it doesn't have to be the feeling that rules you. It can be a feeling that orients you into a place of next steps. And, and here's what I think it is. It is this place where you're reminded that, you know what? I might feel insecure now, but this feeling is a moment. But what is forever is the fact that I belong to the family of God. Mm -hmm. yeah. I belong to Jesus. In fact, Jesus on the cross has died so that he could go into the grave, rise again, ascend to the right hand of the Father to invite you and I to be part of the family of God. This is the power of humility. It's awareness. And, and if you're struggling with insecurity and you're like just dealing with just honest jealousy, like, oh my gosh, why are they successful? But I'm not. You see, humility is a gift that goes, oh my gosh, God has gifted them uniquely. Mm -hmm. Let's let's celebrate that. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Joni and uh, Dr. Doug, I just want to um, brag on my boss, Lisa Turkhurst, for a little bit. Um, she has been a mentor for me for many years, over a decade. She wrote the foreword for my book. I say this about Lisa. Uh, she is a better person off stage than she is on mm -hmm. stage. That's beautiful. And what I've seen Lisa do, and it has m marked me profoundly, is I've seen her champion people. Mm -hmm. 
champion them, like, like fight for their success, to, to believe in the truth of who God has gifted them mm-hmm. to be. And I found this really incredible, powerful thing that if you and I commit to celebrating our brothers and sisters, even if it's painful, it's a means of sanctification that helps us grow in our love and affection for Jesus. And the more we do so, we will find unexpectedly, this is the place that God blesses us. This is the place Mm -hmm. where God lifts us and exalts us. Philippians uh, Philippians 2, 8 and 9, God, Jesus humbled himself. He goes low. Mm -hmm. And then 9, therefore, the therefore is there for Mm -hmm. a reason. Therefore, he is lifted high and exalted. And you and I are invited to that same life. Amen. You know, I was sitting here thinking that the first book I wrote in 2007 was called Surrender All. To me, the word surrender is very close to the word humility. Yes. Because, I mean, when you surrender, um, you humble yourself and you, you surrender to the Word of God, like love your enemies and do good to them that despitefully use you. Mm-hmm. I mean, all the things that are contrary to the flesh. I remember when the Lord gave me that title, I had a pastor tell me, you can't use that word surrender Mm because nobody wants to surrender. It's kind of like the word humility. (laughs) And yet those are very important words. Surrender and humility are both important words. And if we can understand that and grasp it, I think we can do so much more in the kingdom of God, understanding it's not about us. We could do nothing without Him. That's right. Well, I think humility aligns you appropriately. You're talking about the soil. Yes. When you agree with God, that you have value because of his blood. Yes. Not because you're bright or cute. That's right. His blood is the total thing. Mm. Then it aligns you to give other people the same value. Yeah. Like we're different, but I can I can champion you. I can be proud of you. I can be excited for you. Yeah. I don't have to compete. I can compliment. Yes. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. And that is an agreement with God. Yes. You know, and that's what you're kind of going into. You know, some of you, you you're at home though, and you might be going through all kinds of stuff. Sometimes it might feel like you're being humiliated. Sometimes it might be choices you've made. And maybe you, you were like Joel and you're, you're in that season where you're kind of moving away from God. You're moving away. Mm-hmm. And he's like, no, 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 come back. I love you so much. I want to bless you like I'm blessing Joel and every, all these people you see. I want to bless you. Well, if that's you, I just want you to say a simple prayer with me today. And come home mm-hmm. to say, Jesus, forgive me. Yeah. Forgive me of my sins. I want to come home and make you Lord of my life in Jesus' name. Now, that's a simple prayer, but if you've prayed that in your heart, you've become a son or daughter of God, or you come back to the Father. And we got something we want to give to you. We have uh, the book of John that has these QR codes that explains what you're actually reading by Dr. Jean Getz. It's a fantastic introduction to the gospel story of Jesus. And we also have a book called Now What? that'll help you grow in your Christian faith. And I want you to call that number, 1-800-329-0029, because we want you to celebrate that with someone and say, hey, I prayed that prayer. We want to get that material to you either electronically or by mail instantly as fast as possible. So please do that. If you said that prayer a while ago, I want you to call that number. If you have any need in your life, Daystar is a 24-7 prayer line. Put that phone number in your cell phone, 1-800-329-0029 carry it with you because you or a friend might need prayer any time of the day or night. And it's good to know that you got someone you can grab a hold of and they'll grab, grab a hold of heaven for you with you and to hear your prayers be answered. And we want to definitely get you the Gospel of John and the other book if you have uh, said that prayer of salvation day because we want you to know Jesus so much. Yeah. You know, well, Joel, um, this has been a great conversation. And one of the things, you know, it's called The Hidden Peace is your book. But in the, in the book, you talk about the hidden pride. Yeah. Okay. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so hidden pride is so scary because the conversation of hidden pride actually happens in the chambers of your human heart, Yeah, right? it's a heart condition. It's a heart condition. And really what we need is the power of the Holy Spirit to illuminate mm. yeah. the darkest chambers of our human heart. And so you might just be wondering, um, where does hidden pride happen in my life? Hidden pride happens in your life, in the conversation, in the deepest parts of your heart that happens in extremes. So for instance, and we talked Mm -hmm. about this earlier, when somebody experiences success that you long for, what is the honest conversation in your heart? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When somebody experiences a failure or something tragic that happens that you warn them of, you're like, tell them, you know, don't do this is going to happen. What is the honest conversation Mm -hmm. that's in your heart? 
And unless we can bring that honesty to the forefront, mm -hmm. we're going to allow hidden pride to actually take root inside of our heart. Mm -hmm. Here's another part of hidden pride that's actually really scary. I found that hidden pride often presents itself as the fruit of the Spirit. So you're like, wait a minute, what? So like for the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, no, I'm kindness, right? You, I'm with you, right? I'm following you, yeah. So uh, Martin Luther has this great uh, Latin phrase, homo in curvitus in se. And the, the whole idea is that the heart at the fall is bent in on itself. Mm. The human heart curved in on mm. itself. So what is human pride? What is hidden pride? Hidden pride presents itself as love, joy, peace, patience, and yet the ambition of the expression of these things mm -hmm. is not expressed outward towards God. It's expressed inward towards myself. <laughs> so you can live with the momentum of hidden pride for some period of time. Mm -hmm. And it might even cause some kind of good, but that good is compromised because it's not aimed at the one that it ought to be aimed at, which is Yahweh, Yahweh which mm -hmm. is God. It's actually aimed at ourselves. Mm -hmm. What is this? Idolatry. Yeah, I right? find that, I find if you, God will set up circumstances to see how you react to let you know your heart. Yes. It's not always our actions because we can, okay, I'm going to be a good boy. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to smile, right? But it's the person who cuts you off. It's the person who doesn't pay, pay you something you're owed. It's the person who doesn't, like in your case, doesn't know who you are. Right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> or, or treat you with respect. Or judges you. How you treat, yeah. how, how you treat them. Yeah. yeah. And so our reactions sometimes can talk about that. But you also talk about like, Bad things happen to good people. Yeah. Humble people even. Yeah. I think this is such a such a real and serious issue. Uh, the technical term theologically is theodicy. How, how does a good God allow bad things to happen? And, and what's taking place? And um, Joni and Dr. Doug, as I was writing a chapter, this chapter of my book, um, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, to Humble People, uh, there were a couple tragedies that took place in our mm. family. Uh, just uh, a year or so before this, my cousin, Ruthie, uh, was on her college campus at UIC. And uh, as she was going home late one night, she was assaulted and murdered oh on her campus. Gosh. And Ruthie, uh, if you all like met Ruthie, mm. her mama shadow, the sweetest, sweetest girl involved in her church. She did PowerPoint for the worship team. I mean, that girl was literally a saint. Mm -hmm. You're just wondering, God, why? And then um, while I was writing the chapter, my doctoral advisor, Dr. Michael Heiser, uh, a prolific Old Testament scholar, was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. And um, I had remember I just turned in my uh, fourth chapter of my dissertation. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, well, Mike, he's not going to be able to do this anymore because he's, he's fighting for his life. Mm -hmm. Talk about a humble person. Mike texts me. He goes, don't even think about getting a different reader. I'm going to see you across the finish line. Oh. Amen. And he That's sure beautiful. did. That's beautiful. I love that. But a year ago, he had passed. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then my dear friend, Pete Heinegger, who I write about in the story, uh, one of my closest friends, when we worked at a software, Bible software company together, uh, around the same time as Mike got diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. And he had four uh, daughters and a loving wife. And, um, and I was just faced with this question, Lord, why? It doesn't seem fair, right? And I was studying the book of Job. And I was studying the book of Job. I was fascinated by how God interacts with Job. When, when God talks about Job, he uses personal pronouns. He says, my servant, Job. Mm -hmm. And then he asks Job these questions. Where were you? Well, actually, in Hebrew literature, the phrasing is the phrasing of a father who would instruct a son in a loving way. So it's actually an invitation in, mm -hmm. in, in a context of compassion. And here's the most fascinating thing. What I want are answers. Answers to my why. Mm -hmm. And you're probably in pain right now. And you've got, you've got a desire to get answers to your why. Why is this pain happening? Why am I walking around with a smile on my face, but a heavy heart in my human heart? Why is this taking place? And brother and sister, I just want you to know that every time we ask the why question. And we find this throughout the pages of the book of Job, that God responds with who? Well, why does the bad thing happen? Well, who's the one who holds all of creation together? Why is there hurt in my life? Well, who's the one who sent his son to a cross to ensure that we would never have to live in separation from the Father? You see, every time we ask why, 
God is answering who, because that who answer is eternally powerful for us. It's the who, it is Jesus Mm -hmm. who is with us, who walks with us through all of those things. Yeah, that's the the important word there is through. And there are probably people watching right now that you can relate to what Joel is talking about. And maybe you have those why questions. I know for me, I I said, it's okay to ask God questions but it's not okay to question God Mm. or his sovereignty. And so, yeah, I mean, I ask him questions, but you know what he always said to me? And he said it for the last 38 years of ministry is he would always say, if I didn't understand, almost every time he says the same thing, trust me, Joni, trust me. And then on the other side of it, sometimes I get some light and understanding. Sometimes I don't. But at the end of the day, I know that he's faithful to bring us through. And I know that, you're going to be better on the other side of it as long as you hold on to his hand through it. Yes. As long as you trust the word of God through it. And I think you told me this, Doug, um, look at the things that you know God is. Amen. And what he has been in your life. Like make a list of Mm -hmm. all those times that he's been faithful, he's answered prayers, and uh, focus on those things knowing that you are going to get through it. But if that is you today, I want you to go to the phone right now and call and let us pray with you because... There's just an anointing here, I think, to pray for that. Mm. We're going to pray at the end of the program today. So go to the phone. Just give your first name. We don't want any information. We just want to encourage you and bless you. There's just Mm -hmm. something about the power of agreement. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to do that right now. But one one of the things that um, I want to go back to the pride thing, because you think about what Jesus dealt with the most when he was here on this earth was the religious people. So I I wanted you to tap into the judgment part of pride. Yeah. I mean, because that is huge in the body of Christ. Yeah. And um, of course, we have such a big platform. We have so many amazing people Mm -hmm. that encourage and love and pray. But then you have that small segment. Mm -hmm. They want to judge. They think they know your story. They think they understand everything about you when they know nothing. And it's just that judgment and that religious spirit. Yeah. I know you know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. Talk about that. Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, Facebook, Instagram comments. I mean, if you're questioning it, we've got all kinds of places for you to see see it in action. Yeah. Um, I I think one of the things that Jesus is so uh, specifically doing throughout his earthly ministry is he's inviting us into his life, right? Into his life. Uh, And part of the, the judgment piece is the irony of it the irony of the religious rulers, of them trying to, to, to take the law, the Torah, and place it as a heavy burden on all of the people. He said, Jesus is the only one who did it perfectly. Mm. Perfectly. Perfectly. And they're still crucifying him. And one mm. of his own is betraying him. And one of his own is betraying him. the miracles. And, s- any sense. and so I think like, man, one of the things that would be so great for all of us, if we just paused and slowed mm. down and took a step back, I call this a theology of remembrance. If we just remembered who we were apart from who Christ is. Amen. Yes. And at that moment, if we can keep that front and center, man, this would be a powerful uh, uh, expression of exercising humility and kindness and compassion to our fellow brothers and sisters. Because, y'all, disunity in the body of Christ is a tactic of the enemy Mm -hmm. to show a world that is desperate for the power of the kingdom that it's not worth it. Yeah. Amen. And yet Jesus, this is the high priestly prayer of John 17, Jesus is praying for them to be one as the Father and the Son and the Spirit are one. And so unity is so, so important. In Matthew 11, 29, I'll close with this. It's this amazing passage where Jesus invites us to an exchange of yokes. You know, we know this one, but the context of it is very important. It's actually the religious rulers who had leveraged and used judgment Mm. and they had used the law as as a burden on the people. And this is what Jesus says. Hey, let's do an exchange of yokes. Not a removal, an exchange of yokes. And when you do an exchange of yokes, you take the heavy burden, you put it on Yahweh, on Jesus. And then Jesus t- takes our, like, mm. like when that happens, he says, then um, you'll experience rest. I love that. Real rest. And then he says, come, follow me, because I am gentle mm-hmm. and humble. Yeah, well, I, I understand. I mean, I'm a psychologist, and I, I don't have the intelligence to judge people. <laughs> When, when you really realize you're a lamb, yes, it doesn't matter how many degrees you got. We got between us, we got a bunch, but we really don't know someone's story. Yeah, That's we right. don't have the ability to judge. 
And you know, there's so many people out there that have called for prayer while we were talking and having our conversation. The They're still on the there's line now. There's still a bunch of people. We're going to pray over your prayer call. request if you stay on the line. Absolutely. But Dr. Joel, Keep will praying. you lead us in prayer yes. for these for these people that Absolutely. called in? Absolutely, Absolutely, Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus. And we thank you for the countless that have put in prayer requests that are walking through pain and hurt and anxiety and, and have real needs. And we know, Lord Jesus, King, that, that you care for them, that you love them, and that your love was expressed on the cross. So we pray that your spirit, the spirit of comfort, would invade the hearts and the homes of everyone that is listening in this moment, that they would experience the tangible comfort that can only come from you. And we pray, Lord, that their needs would be met yes, in your Jesus. perfect wisdom. We trust you, King Jesus, and we bend knee in humility to you and your kingdom. In your name we pray, amen.